As many of you know, social ecology goes back many decades, goes back to the early to mid-1960s, before there was even anything we might call an ecological or environmental movement. And <clears throat> emerged at a time <clears throat> excuse me, when environmental scientists were beginning to raise a discussion of whether there might be some inherent conflict between the myths of growth that are at the center of our social and economic system and the needs of, of living ecosystems. And social ecology, particularly through the writings of Murray Bookchin, of course, took that to the next step, saying that within ecological science, there is the germ for a fundamentally revolutionary and reconstructive outlook on where we go from here. That understanding emerged from a period that's come to be known as the Great Acceleration, the period in the 1950s and 60s when economic growth was happening at a lightning pace, where the pace of increased consumption sometimes exceeded population growth by 10 times over. And coming out of this period, we had the extremes of pollution and ecosystem disruption that eventually formed the seeds for the emergence of the environmental movement. One of the important insights that's become even clearer in recent years, particularly through the work of the Marxist historian Andreas Mom, is the central role of fossil capital in that evolution. Uh, Mom describes how um, the introduction of coal-based production in the British textile industry back in the early years of the 19th century was primarily implemented to facilitate greater control over labor, but in the course of doing so, created the myth and created the possibility of the kind of 24-7, 365 days a year patterns of production that we, of course, have come to take for granted as part of the process of moving production of textiles from the countryside, from dependence on the run of the river, hydroelectric, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, hydropower, which there was never a shortage of, um, into the cities where labor could be controlled and production could be round the clock. Um, and, Fossil fuels have been at the absolute center of that myth. And we know from the reports of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that came out over the course of the past year. I'll have a lot more to say about basic climate science and the climate movement on Friday. And I'll show you some pictures then to illustrate some of this. Um, We know that fossil fuels are, sorry, we know from the IPCC reports that have come out over the past year that we need to not only, as Earl pointed out, um, reduce fossil fuel consumption in half in less than 10 years, but eliminate it completely in about 30 years. And a system that is that dependent on fossil fuel-based production is going to have a very hard time doing that. A system that understands that the fossil fuel industries are the most profitable industries in history is going to have a very hard time doing that. So reinforces what we've been saying all along, that we need a fundamentally different system to address these problems. We also know <coughs> that the dynamics of growth have direct effects on everyone's lives. Uh, my colleague and friend Fred Magdoff, whose name I mentioned earlier in the context of introducing me to Miguel, um, did some research a number of years ago and mapped out periods of five years going back several decades and showed that the periods when employment has been stable in the United States have been consistently been periods of even faster economic growth than we've seen at any time in the last 20 years. 
So the dynamics of growth have a direct effect on people's lives, on the stability of people's employment. Another important discussion that I want to introduce you to is that some of you might be familiar with is the discussion of planetary boundaries. How many people have heard that term? A few of you have, that's good. Um, we talk about the climate crisis and the consequences of the climate crisis, and I'll have a lot more to say about that on Friday. But from research over the last 10 years, mostly from researchers in Europe, we know that even though everything else that's happening on Earth is profoundly related to the disruption of the climate system, that there are also a number of fairly independent variables that are measures of aspects of the health of our ecosystems that operate somewhat independently of climate. And I'll just name those, and maybe when I bring my slides on Friday, I'll show you a, a graphic image that has been in circulation for a number of years that helps illustrate this a little bit more clearly. But let me just name what these other <coughs> planetary boundaries are that are undergoing severe disruption, and in some cases on the verge of collapse. We have biosphere integrity. We know we're in the course of the sixth major wave of extinction since the origins of life. The question of novel entities, the persistence of toxic chemicals in the environment, and the profoundly disruptive effects those have on every living being. We have the problem of, of ozone depletion, which we've somewhat brought under control since the Montreal Protocol of the late 1980s. Some people saw that as a model for how climate diplomacy might succeed, but of course the production of chlorofluorocarbons and other ozone disruptors are a relatively small piece of the economy, especially compared to the fossil fuel industry. We have the problem of ocean acidification, which is of course directly related to the accumulation of CO2 we have the question of biogeochemical flows, especially the phosphorus, and nitrogen cycles on Earth, which are undergoing severe disruption. We have the broad question of land system change, the loss of forests and other uh, key ecosystems. We have the problem of fresh water use, which is seriously in uh, threatened in, in many parts of the world. And finally, the issue of atmospheric aerosol loading, the persistence of uh, particulates of a size that not only can get deep inside our own lungs, but that have disruptive effects on all of life. So if we want to look holistically at the question of ecological limits, we need to look at all of these phenomena, which of course, as I said, are very much interrelated with the climate situation. Is somebody keeping time? How, how much more? Five more minutes, perfect. Um, so this really sets the stage in many ways for the discussion of degrowth and the imperative for reducing production and consumption on the part of the tiny minority of the world's population that are responsible for overwhelming share of production and consumption, and especially excess consumption. And I'll show you some charts on Friday from Oxfam and a couple of other sources that help illustrate that in a lot more detail. As, as was mentioned the other day, the critics of degrowth often frame it as, frame it in terms of, um, accusing degrowth advocates of uh, promoting some kind of austerity, promoting uh, people downscaling their way of life, and of course the rich need to do that, but most people in the world who are operating at levels of subsistence or below uh, obviously are not in a position to think about degrowing their production and consumption. Uh, 
book that recently came out, one of the authors is a, a good friend of ours at the ISC, Aaron Ben Sinchen from Belgium, working with two German colleagues uh, on a book called The Future is Degrowth that just came out. They lay out very clearly that for degrowth advocates, it's not about austerity, it's about redistribution, it's about a direct attack on the scale of inequality, the magnitude of inequality that is really at the center of so many of the social problems we face. It's about transitioning toward an economy of care in contrast to an economy of continual, that aspires to continual growth in production, continual concentration of economic power of accumulation in the hands of the few. One important example, and Earl already did a brilliant job of introducing this, has to do with what about the transition to renewable energy. We know if we're going to get rid of fossil fuels, we need to get the energy we need from renewable sources, meaning the sun and the wind, but Solar and wind energy especially is implemented on a mass scale by global corporations today. It's heavily reliant on mining, uh, not just the mining that takes place in, on indigenous lands here in North America, but literally around the world. Uh, there was a really in-depth profile in the New York Times just a few weeks ago of the effects of cobalt mining on people in the Congo and other places in Southern Africa. We know about the ways in which indigenous peoples in Bolivia are facing the consequences of the pressure for increased lithium mining to keep uh, building our batteries. These are serious problems, and we can't have, as Earl pointed out, a transition to renewable energy on the backs of indigenous people who are victims of mining. So what that means is that the renewable economy is not going to able, be able to operate at the scale of the capitalist economy that we all in this room grew up in. That we need a fundamentally different system. We need a system, as again, Earl said much more eloquently than I will, that is rooted in conservation, that's rooted in eliminating excess consumption that's rooted in systems that enhance our quality of life as opposed to the quantity of what we consume. We know about the principle of blend vivir as discussed in Latin America. We know that in most indigenous languages there are terms uh, that have very similar meanings. Um, that express the same basic idea. And it also brings us back to something Dan pointed out the other day, and that is the long-range vision of social ecology, that what we're really about is a profound reharmonization between our human communities and the rest of the natural world. Thank you. Demystifying degrowth. We are taught that buying more things right now is good for us and for the economy. We are not taught that if everyone used as much energy as the average American, we would need five planets. We are also taught to do things that grow the economy and maximize short-term growth. But luxury condos earn money quicker than community health clinics. Arming millions for war swells the economy more than conflict mitigation. Instead of extending the life of our products to reduce waste, we're encouraged to replace our electronics every year and buy new clothes every season. Our economy is based on our right to consume, but not our right to live. But the soil must be fertile for us to eat. The air and water must be clean for us to live, to plan for the future, to find meaning in our lives. 
How can the economy be reassembled to grow these things? This is the core of degrowth, which embraces a care-based economy, meaning we produce in accordance with ecological limits and divide it up to fulfill everyone's needs. To think of work that does not inherently require consumption or mass production and instead sustains life. Teaching children how to read, restoring acres of soil, helping people heal from trauma, these are all degrowth. A society that defines productivity and labor not by profit, but by time, dedicated to oneself, to family, friends, and to activities that affirm one's humanity. By organizing ourselves around the principles of care, sufficiency, and autonomy, we also reduce our consumption of energy and materials. Imagine a world that measures wealth and prosperity, not by how life is destroyed, but how life is created, supported, and nourished. A world that ensures future generations clean air, water, and soil. It's more than possible. It's necessary. Degrowth is a movement to unlearn the dominant ideology of infinite growth that has been ingrained in every aspect of our individual and collective lives.